So obviously in some senses, we're kind of at a standstill until we at least get past New Year's. You know, um, I think, first of all, between things Julie's kind of dug into and heard and things that I've dug around on, I really think IDPH has their essential caregiver stuff ready. Yeah. I don't think until the numbers come down that they're going to release it. Yeah. And at this point, as much as we all want it, I can't blame them either. Um, that being said, we need to use the next seven weeks or so to be as proactive as we can. Um, doing things like, I mean, Fran and I are still working on the videos with the interviews that I did. I have a few more that I wanna put in there. Um, and then I, I have an idea of what we should do with these interviews once we get it condensed down and it looks good. You know, Fran set up a YouTube channel that we can link people to. So I think if we can work on, and I'm gonna ask somebody to take this job because I realize I can't keep doing everything. And um, I have a really good friend who has to have some major surgery and I need to be able to deal with that too. Um, I think if we get hold of Charlie's secretary and ask her if she could help us compile email lists of all the elected officials that are staying in office and hopefully the ones that are coming in in January, that hopefully that we can compose a short email with a link to this video that Fran and I are putting together and a few other bits of information so that we're not overloading them with an initial email, but we're giving them enough information that, hey, why you have time between now and whatever date they start their new session, could you please look this over? We need your help. You know, make it very short, kind of like the call of action, but even shorter and um, a little more to the point. Um, could I have everyone at some point or another just shoot me a video of an impact statement from you yourself as well? Just yeah. record yourself um, a short where you are and how you're how it's affecting you, if that's okay. Oh, that would be wonderful. Um, and, it and it doesn't have to be, I mean, if it's just you want your voice and then just shoot me a picture or something, I don't care. I'm just, um, we're going uh, to, I'm hoping to do multiple things with what we get. And so maybe even get something put together that we could shoot because off. Does that make sense? No, I actually, and I think it's a great idea because every one of us has a different perspective from, you know, Tim. Tammy, who has two people in, a, in facilities to you and I with our son, Bruce, it's himself. I think it's a really good idea. Okay, Hi, Lucy. Here There's you are. Lucy. I'm here, for just, uh, I'm here for just a few minutes today, but I wanted to thank you for all your caring and love and support. We love it, you. We love you. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot. My sister is still in care. If even if she wasn't, I would still be with you. It's a big thing. It's not only the facilities, but it's the management company. It's the people, the corporations that own the facilities that want to maximize profits. So one step at a time. I agree, but you got to promise us you're going to take care of you first. I am, and I have been very blessed with supportive family and friends through this whole journey. And your support through this lockdown has meant much more than I can ever let anyone know. We all understand because we don't feel like we're alone fighting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And let me know when you go into St. Louis. I promise I will come out to St. Charles. I will let you know. So when I go, hopefully over Thanksgiving, okay, we'll be able to get together. That's fine. I'm going to have to leave now, but I'll check later today to see what's up and what I can do. The t-shirts look great. Yeah, Thank you. And we're all in it together. Yes, we are. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lucy. Take yep. care, sweetheart. Hugs. You too.
Okay, Fran, you want to show us what video you have first? Reports that people are, are not following the compassionate care guidance visitation. And we even heard that it's because IDPH's reopening guidance is, is more stringent. Um, it's on page 10 of the reopening guidance. If you take a look at it and it says indoor compassionate care visitation on a case by case basis. That case by case person centered um, is actually this is the higher standard person centered care. Situations warranting consideration are not limited to the end of life. Yes, we gave you some cases that could be considered, but these are not the only things. If you have weight loss or decline or a close resident, um, a close relative really passed away, it could be a situation where you have any sort of failure to thrive, any sort of psychosocial issues or concerns. I know it's a challenge, especially with increasing um, rates, but you really need to be able to point to the fact that you are considering compassionate care case by case. And if you feel the person can benefit from it, um, you really need to to offer that that compassionate care visitation. Thank you, Deb, for adding that. That is very important. Fabulous. You cut that just the way I wanted. But this is perfect because this way every time and I would obviously, you know, put that in our files. We'll put it everywhere we can. Now, um, we do have we talked about it, a YouTube channel that I'm posting all our Zooms to. And any other thing that you might want posted there, because Facebook is becoming very not user friendly to get videos loaded. Right. So on that comment, Facebook's not being user friendly and it, it, it's not. We don't see half of what each other posts. Right. Missing more than we are getting. I do know I'm going to open another page here and I'll share with you guys in a minute. I know some of you guys have seen the Essential Caregiver Coalition website and some haven't. Yeah. Um, it's a little confusing at first, but once yep. you get it, it's not. Okay, so this is the Essential Caregivers Coalition website. There's some real advantages here. Now, when you originally go to it, you have to sign in and set up an account just because it is not saying that it's not open because it is, but we're trying to, you know, monitor who's coming in, who's coming out, trying to keep hackers out of it and trying to keep trolls out. So once you've signed in, which I can't pull that page because every browser I have has had it and you can only see that before you've signed up. But once you sign in and go to this whole home and you see this, it gets a little confusing of where am I going next and what, how do I figure things out? But if you go to discover, so here you go. As you see, like here, when you're in topics, which this is the, where I'm moving my mouse now, this is what I need to have natively move to where it's front and center, where it says start here. This will give you a tour of how to use it and get rid of like friends said to me yesterday, she tried to go into it, but it was a little confusing <coughs> and it is. But once we all get used to it, I think it will work right. Um, and then there's a zillion things, you know, members in the press. We've been working on uploading every article we can find anywhere, whether it's about um, caregivers for compromise, the essential care collation, any of it, because that way as we build, like I said, wanting to send this email out to representatives, we can just send them a link in that email saying, here is... 150 articles across the United States about this issue without having to give them links to 150 articles. I've set up a page on here. When you get into the United States and then goes to topics, I think that's where I, the Illinois page is, maybe not. So I have set up an Illinois page. And like I said, I'm still learning my way around this, but this way we can also set up things that are just pertinent to Illinois. And I think as much as we're using Facebook, we need it for the social aspect of it to gather, to collect people and get them helping us. But this for working forward and not losing things will be better because there's no advertising on it. There's no um, somebody else deciding what pops in your feed. Yeah. And you can also 
sign up for like a, a either a weekly or a daily or however you want an update of what's going on to it. And you can pick by categories of what you want it to tell you when it sends you that daily email. And I'm not saying we're giving up Facebook because we need it for the media aspect, but I think to get away from media and to make things maybe a little more productive, we need to be using, hopefully using both. Um, Maidalee and Miko are very organized and have some, some connections the rest of us are not gonna have. They, um, first of all, um, Maidalee is a, talent agent in, in, the, in California. So she has accessibility to celebrities. She actually has a producer who's willing to help cut and edit videos for us. Um, so that, that way she has a little more, uh, you know, just because of what she does for a living. And Nico somehow was in the right place at the right time. And when they did all the hearings in New York, um, the major hearings over, you know, Governor Como um, letting them bring new residents into the facilities with COVID and it, when they started the process in the um, investigations in, in New York, she actually testified and she's still part of that. Mm. So again, more people that have connections and it's not going to matter what state they're in. We need one state to either get an ACLU here, judgment or a OCR we only need one state and it will work itself from there. Last Friday night, I spoke with a doctor. His name is Dr. Michael Wasserman. And he is currently, I think, living in Colorado, but he is a geriatric specialist who at one time was the medical director for a large conglomerate of nursing homes and walked away from that because he realized that just like Lucy said, the, especially the big facilities are in this for nothing but the money. Yep. And it's all about their real estate and their buildings and not about the residents. Yep. And Michael's trying very hard to use his name to help this whole issue. Um, his big goal right now is tracking down Dr. Fauci. And like he said, even though he has connections, Dr. Fauci is probably one of the most guarded people right now as far as not easily accessible because he's so busy not you know not guarded in a physical way but um he first of all truly believes in that nothing that goes on in a facility should be anything but patient-centered care and everything should be based on that and that with the patient-centered care should also come the family-centered care because they are hand in hand so he is also willing, if we come up with things he can do to help us, um, whether it's, you know, put a short video together, if he has time, whatever, he will also help us. Um, and at this point, we're, you know, we need to take whatever help from whoever just to get. Tammy, how's your mom and your mother-in-law? Well, my mom, I think last week when we had this call, I thought she was doing pretty well with the COVID. She was asymptomatic and it was her stroke that was really challenging her to have any quality of life. But then on Friday afternoon, she, the COVID hit her like five days after her test. And anyway, she's on hospice now um, since last Saturday. And she's, she's just hanging on. I don't know. Are they I, letting you in to see her? No. Well, no. My brother and I got to see her for three hours, two people for three hours. She's at the hospital still. Okay. But because of her COVID status, right? Okay. you know, we're risking the rest of our family and my grandson and, uh, you know, I'm just, so in a way the iPad is not great, but it's, uh, it's about all we have right now. So um, we're seeing on the iPad, but then my mother, my sister-in-law did get compassionate visits with my mother-in-law though. Okay, good. So, which is great. Um, so she, they're letting her see her for two meals a day, as many days as she wants to go. Oh, nice. So I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that she's, I mean, we're going to lose both our moms in the next few months, right. you know, but if they move your mom back, take that video clip that Fran just did. Yeah. And there you go. Yeah. And anybody from <clears throat> any facility in the state of Illinois that is willing to try to argue after that, they're a fool because then 
we're just calling IDPH. We have the person's name we need. We have what we need now, at least. And, and they very clearly said, if it will benefit a resident is the only real qualification. Yeah. I mean, it, that was a gold mine and it just worked out right. I had emailed all 13 or 14 of my contacts on Thursday after somebody had said something about, again, being turned down and set me off and asked them to do that. I also asked them to put it on their website and sent an email blast, which they didn't do, but it's a huge step that they did. They did at least acknowledge something we asked and did it. Yeah. Again, it's up to the facilities. I mean, if they're, again, I guarantee my facility is so hard headed and they're so big. I mean, this is a corporate giant. And that's why with you, Bruce, like I said, for your brother, qualify, and I would give them that and tell them to have their corporate people listen to that because the, the fines that can come at IDPH are humongous. Julie found for me what I've been digging for. There's some new staffing guidelines that come into place sometime in January, I believe. Good. That um, literally, the, the gist of it is, if they are not meeting their staffing requirements, the fine will equate to, if it would have cost them $100 an hour in labor, the fine's going to cost them $200, essentially. And they're saying it could cost tens of millions of dollars across Illinois in the first year. But the problem is there's no staffing requirements. Okay. No, this will have a minimum staffing requirement. That's what this is. Oh, okay. Cool. It's a new, um, it's a law that becomes law in January. Correct, Carrie? Yes. If we're understanding it right. Um, the only thing is, and this is what I'm still trying to decipher. And I'm actually just going to call up to Illinois Healthcare Association this afternoon because I've had no luck deciphering it any other way. Um, the law, they started creating this, I think, in 2019. It was passed. It was all ready to go into effect in January. Um, Illinois Healthcare Association, in the article Julie and I read, fully agreed. You know, they negotiated with it. They were okay with it. And then now all of a sudden we're, we know because of the meetings Julie and I listened to that um, Illinois Healthcare Association is trying to get JCAR, which is uh, Joint Something Committee... It's, it's members of both the House and the Senate from both sides of the party that overlook laws and overlook new regulations and things to make sure it's fair and legal and whatever. But now they're trying to get JCAR to back down on the fines. And that's what, why we're not sure. That's the part that doesn't make any sense because it clearly states in the article that Julie found that uh, Illinois Healthcare was part of the decision-making factor. So we're trying to understand why that part is going on. And I don't have an answer to that yet. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't uh, delay the, I don't know how they do that, but the, with the staffing shortages that are prevalent right now, you know, it, it might be hard for them to meet in some areas of the state to meet that minimum. It is exhausted. It is very exhausting, but at the same time, one of the things that is mandated if they can't meet, even now, if they're not meeting the real ridiculous minimum there is, they're supposed to be self-reporting. And that's part of what I have learned. If, if you are running on um, a shortage and you're not self-reporting, you can be fined tremendously. At least if you're self-reporting, the... And the state knows that the state also does have some flexibility to be helping some facilities, you know, where they're bringing in um, National Guard and different things because of the pandemic. If they're not self-reporting, they're not even looking for a way to solve their own problem. But no, you are correct. There is a shortage everywhere. Yeah. One of the things Dr. Wasserman had said to me that was very interesting as we talked and I was telling him about where Lynn is. He said like less than 1% of the overall long-term care facilities in the country are private owned like Lens is, all the rest of it, or even small corporate owned. I mean, I think where Fran's son is probably falls into the small corporate owned theory because they do have, I think, more than we, we do. But is everybody else's big facility corporate run? My, 
ours is it's corporate run and there's multiple locations. Um, and in fact, the facility administrator, even on my sister-in-law getting visits, like we asked last Friday or Thursday, when my mother-in-law suddenly they said, you know, they even told us her condition was grave or really declined. And um, we asked for visits and they had to ask corporate, didn't get the answer until Monday. And honestly, I, it took a lot of restraint not to email them back and say, well, I hope that's not too late. But because and I know they're str struggling with the whole thing too. I just don't think they, their, their corporate culture does not allow them to make a decision at the facility level. And that's part of the problem. And that, and that, you know, I mean, that's, you don't want to just beat them up and make them feel bad, but it's, it's kind of ridiculous to be. So one of the things, to make a decision. one of the things, um, I don't remember who was Dr. Wasserman said, or somebody else in one of the webinars that I've listened to, if you're definitely, if you're corporate owned, and you're running into those kind of stumbling blocks, ask them for the contact for their regional manager. Okay, because like they said, the big ones all have regional managers. The regional managers should be in a position to make a decision. So oh, I, I just called their corporate office, got a real nice secretary and then talked to their director of nursing. And then I, then I got a call from their COO. It took a while to find the phone number, but. And that's it, keep pushing and document. That's why, you know, as much as, oh, sometimes it's easier to pick up the phone. And if you do pick up the phone, follow it with an email for, you know, kind of going back over your conversation. Mm -hmm. Because especially then, if we're getting the ombudsman's in call, involved, they could say, hold on, I know that they called you on this date, this date, and this date, and they sent you this, this, and this. Um, mm -hmm. Because the ombudsman, especially with the latest updates, they really are trying to help people. You know, the problem is there's what, 20 of them across the entire state or something? They're drowning. So have you applied for compassionate care, care visits or anything with your facility? Okay, and we can help you find out how to do it. It's very simple. Um, do, is he in a, do you know if it's corporate owned or large corporate or because that does definitely play into some of this. Yes, it's corporate. Okay. And I sent her a private message with my phone number. Hmm. So if nothing else, I can, she can call me later and I can give her, you know, the gist of where's the quickest and easiest route. Um, just, I don't know, on a slim chance, it, what corporate, what corporate ration is it? It could be the same one I've already dealt with. I've got right. the CEO's phone number. Right. Do you, what corporation that owns his, do you know? And if nothing else too, we can also help get you in touch with an ombudsman in your area to help you because they are a lot of help. And this is the reason I, like I said, we won't give up Facebook ever just to be able to find people, you yeah. know, and they can find us because the other website is going to be more of an invite only, but in the long run, I think it's going to be beneficial too, because definitely Miko and uh, Mentally have the same feelings. We all do that. We're fighting for a short-term solution, but we need to solve a, a long-term problem. Yeah. And obviously we do know that there are others in some of the groups that are not looking at it that way. They just want to solve today and not worry about the rest. And that's not going to fix anything because whether it's COVID or it's whatever weird virus comes next or even just the regular flu or C. diff, COVID has set a precedence of, oh, we'll just shut it down. And we need to make sure that that availability is not there because I, th I think and that was another one of the things um, that because of COVID, the facilities are going to try to just say, oh, it's easier to shut it down. Let's just shut it. And we need to make sure that they can't. I got creative and I went to the um, Florida page and searched by my parents' facility's name because um, they have um, places in several states including Florida. And um, I found 
some people and one person even this is before they act and acted their act and um so she was just really desperate uh, could anybody help her and text her and so I texted her and um she texted me like right back and she um she said that you have to the the page that gives the um, contact information for the corporate offices is actually under a little bit different name. And she, um, so she gave me that name and she um, gave me the person that she talked to. And then she also told me that they, her facility has had no problems since they even um, started the essential caregiver act. Yes. So do you know why they're under two different names? No. Okay, so that that's part of what this that I learned on Friday night. So this is their shell game. One part of their corporation owns the land, another part owns the building, a third entity owns operates the facility. So when number three gets that million dollar fine and slap on the wrist and we're going to shut you down, oh God, we're done. We'll walk away we hand it back and there's five other companies that are still part of A and B that now take it over. It's a shell game with money. That's why they're doing this. It's horrible. It is it's absolutely us. horrible. Um, that's us. Exactly. Okay, that's where Bruce is. It is it is the majority of large facilities today. Um, when I looked at one of the lists of just ranking facilities here in Illinois. And I was just looking at things in my area. Um, the ratings and how bad some of them are blew my mind away. And all of them were the ones that are owned by the same companies over and over again that have three facilities and, you know, a 30 or 50 mile radius. This was something interesting about my parents' facility. So I went to the, the Google reviews and um, I mean, they have like, I don't know if it's like four and a half or four and three quarter. There's hardly any negative reviews and there's so many glowing reviews. There's some, some pretty um, interesting negative ones too, but then somebody came on and he said um, this, um, uh, the executive director is just horrible. And she, all these things about her and she's just paying people to who are her friends to come in here and write reviews. So that is a very accurate assessment. It goes on in every business. Uh, okay, whether you're talking about they're using a Google review, they're using Yelp for a restaurant, they're using the survey codes on the bottom of their receipts. Okay, um, I promise you from working for Sam's for enough years and working and managing three franchise Papa Murphy stores, it, this is common practice, okay? in every industry, which is why you're much better off go on to like US News and World Reports um, annual reports of how they rate hospitals, how they rate facilities, um, how things are graded. There's a couple different ones that I've seen, um, but, but those are gonna be more accurate because they don't have, they have public input, but not public, um, there's no way for the public to skew their numbers. Um, you know, anybody who runs a facility and somebody puts a bad review up, they're going to ask 10 or 12 people they know to put good ones up just to push it down. It's that easy. I don't know if you saw the new uh, thing Mayor Lightfoot put on Twitter. If anybody has Twitter, it's about some kind of training for these facilities. You know, there's twenty billion dollars, twenty billion dollars for nursing homes. I mean, they're getting so much funding from the government; it's not even funny. I mean, this is a money thing. Uh, that's twenty more, twenty billion more from everything else I found on this training. You can actually go in and see what nursing homes did the training. Like my Manor Care, their, their corporate corporation has done no training for these facilities, some kind of specialized training on infection control and, and a bunch of other stuff due with COVID. Yep. So they were actually talking about that on IHCA yesterday. Um, they will pay each facility 
$6,000 for each person that sits through it, the infection control training, just to make sure that it offsets the labor. It's a no brainer. That's, that's why we had to have a lockdown is because nursing homes have never really had a solid infection control Correct. procedure. I mean, if they had one, we wouldn't have had to lock down in March because right. they could handle it. Right. Right. And like, you know, hospitals shut their door. I mean, they did, they did, you know, deter visitors, but, but they, they, they have infection control procedures and they challenge them all the time and, and facilities, long-term facilities just didn't, they might've had something on paper, but nobody knew what it said and it didn't say anything worthwhile. So. Well, exactly. And, you know, I mean, how, how many times, you know, and I guess it depends how long you've all been dealing with facilities, but you know, it's like C. diff. It is absolutely one of the most contagious things there is. And if it winds up in a facility and they don't have infection control on day one, within a week, half the building has C. diff. You know, I mean, and that's, again, I'll give my son's facility props because a couple of uh, five, six years ago, Fran was actually still working there when my son had C. diff and they managed to contain it to make sure nobody else got it those things are very, you know, those are good examples. If you've been in a facility long-term and they have not shut down for C. diff or the flu or some of those other things, you know, at least they have some infection control. Bruce, did you have your brother apply for compassionate care? No, I guess I need to have it, but I know my facility, they're going to be like, no, no, no. Because the other day they brought my wheelchair in, my, my old wheelchair from repair. They were like, okay, you can go to the library and switch me out, right? Which, and then do some adjustments. And they were on, on the company to get out of the building immediately after they put me in the literature. I said, wait, I got some adjustments. My facility is so stringent because they got COVID in here that no matter what you do, I mean, I don't even know how to apply for it. Where do you apply for it? So have your brother call me. Because it actually will be better coming, starting with him. Okay. Okay. Give him my number. You have it. And I'll tell him what he needs to do. Um, my son's building has four active cases. I'm in there five days a week still. We're near where the cases are. Compassionate care visits are the one thing that is still allowed to go on. They have to set up a space for it. I mean, I'm in a very designated space where nobody else is when I see my son. And it's cleaned between each visit. I mean, my husband was there Sunday and gave him a haircut. I need my brother to come in and help me exercise because my muscles are deteriorating because I'm not exercising. And they won't do anything about it. They're supposed to legally keep us well, up. Any billing for your rehab and your stuff? Do you know, Bruce? Oh, I don't know. I'm not doing PT here right now. So they can't be billing. So it's part of your plan, just part of your plan of care? That they're supposed to be doing the exercises, and they're not doing it. In our rights, in our rights uh, booklet, or I, you know, I've studied the rights. They're supposed to keep us up to the. They're supposed to provide services. Now, we have to get a doctor's uh, note to have us do therapy here. Yes. Technically, they should be providing everybody with. Some, they're not even doing rehab right now because there's so many COVID cases, but. Right. Tech, in our rights booklet, it says they got to provide the services. Okay. Right. Keep it if behind. nothing else, they should at least be having a CNA or somebody doing basic um, range of motion, range of motion, and things with you. Okay, yeah, doing that. They have activities come through every now and then, and we'll do exercise in our wheelchair, like dancing around and stuff. Which you know, I can do that on my own. Okay, my thing is, I need some. I talked to the uh, head of uh, physical therapy yesterday. I want some bands attached to my bed so I can, when I'm in bed, I can work my arms out. You know, I used to be able to almost lift myself on my wheelchair when I was in the gym. I was doing, getting some quite a bit of muscle on me when, before COVID hit. And I can't use my left arm that much anymore. I got to go have some uh, MRI done to it. I went to the doctor yesterday. But the thing is, I need to, I need to get my body back into shape, you know. Yeah, if you know any funding sources for vehicles, 
that would be nice. When you move out, once you get out, finding funding sources become much easier. Yeah. Okay. As long as you're there, the finding the funding sources are not. But once you get out of there, it becomes much easier. Those days are yeah. over. And trust me, I'm I'm good at finding them. Yeah. I'm also good at fundraising. You know when the reporter's going to run that story? I was just getting ready to ask you. Did she? Did you end up talking with her? Yeah, I, uh, she called me yesterday morning, and I talked to her for twenty or thirty minutes. Real Good. nice. She just told me it could be yeah, this yeah. week. Well, which we have to what today and tomorrow for the weekly. Um, they do have a. They pretty put out a pretty decent sized Sunday paper. That would be amazing if it could go in the Sunday paper. Yes. Um, I, I, she didn't say, I, I'm not, she said maybe this week, but most definitely next week. Okay. Well, I know for sure our local paper yeah, is running the letter to the editor that I sent them because they called me yesterday to verify my identity. And then I've heard from the St. Louis paper. I haven't gotten confirmation, but part of it was they both wanted me to revise because I didn't know I had to be to a 250 word minimum maximum. Right, right. And I was 506. Mm -hmm. Somehow I got it to 250. I actually got it to 249. Yeah, when it comes out, Carrie, I'll let you know, and okay. I'll take a picture for you too, so you right. can have it for your files. Well, that's right. You know, just again, the more media we get, I don't care how we get it. If, um, I don't care if it comes from you know letters to the editor, whatever we've got to do. Right.